World Heavyweight Championship, Ric Flair goes against Lex Luger. Yes, live before thousands uh, at the beautiful Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, Florida, the home of the Daytona 500, and tonight, the home of Battle of the Belts, number three. I'm Gordon Sola, your host. With me, of course, Stan Rhodes, the uh, commentator on U.S. class wrestling. And Stan, we've got quite an item in store We for certainly us. do, Gordon. We're going to be seeing Stan Lane and Steve Kerr very shortly defending their uh, U.S. tag team title against the Sheep Herders. And as well, Tim Horner has come into town to defend his uh, United States Junior Heavyweight uh, title. That's going to be an interesting matchup. AWA Championship is on the line with Nick Bockwinkle and Kendo Nagasaki. And I must add that Chris Champion, the current champion of the Bahamas heavy, Heavyweight, is uh, going to be uh, putting his line, his title on the line with Kendall uh, Wyndham. And uh, the Road Warriors are going to see what they can do against the Shock Troops. Plus a lot of the, entertainment, a lot of excitement. No question about it, plus the world champion Ric Flair. Right now, a match in the ring. It's the Cuban assassin moving out against a very popular Tyree Pride. Once again, we're coming to you live and direct from the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, Florida. And uh, by special dispensation, because uh, these matches are coming to you from Florida, the Florida Heavyweight Championship more than likely will be the last event this evening on the card. A pinfall! A pinfall! Quick action there, Gordon. Tyree Pride. And we do have a pinfall, and we'll be back with more action on Battle of the Belts 3. In 15 minutes and 20 seconds, Tyree Pride. Say so. Waiting now for the appearance of the U.S. Tag Team Champions, the fabulous ones, Stan Lane and Steve Kern. And now they come through the curtains and they're on their way to ringside. Three, here at Daytona Beach, from the, the Sunshine State, the fabulous ones, Stan Lane and Steve Kern. At a combined weight of 472 pounds. The fabulous one. Introducing in the ring at this time from New Zealand. At a combined weight of 475 pounds, the Sheep Herder. Sheep Herders going up against the Fabulous Ones. All of the championship matches tonight, with the exception of the NWA World Heavyweight Championship match, uh, will be one fall with a 30-minute time limit. One fall, 30-minute time limit. All of the competitors have agreed to this contractually. Uh, Bill Alfonso, the referee for this first event, and Stan, the Sheep Herders, I know you've watched them in action before, a wild, unruly pair. Well, I'll tell you this much, Gordon. They uh, certainly look at uh, rules as something that can't be broken. As a matter of fact, they don't even bother to break them. They just go ahead and ignore them. So I think that's going to kind of set the pace here tonight in terms of uh, what Stan Lane and Steve Kerr need to look forward to is uh, some broken uh, rules, no doubt. And uh, they began right away as the Sheep Herders now with Williams pounding away in the midsection. Now they're double teaming on uh, Stan Lane in the uh, far corner. And Lane lashing out with a series of forearms. Catches him with a uh, mule kick and it is... Uh, the team of the Sheep Herders suddenly leaving the ring. And, of course, much to the uh, dismay of the fans, but one thing they do uh, do when they get out of the ring like that, they break the momentum of the uh, fabulous ones. Well, they certainly do. I've noticed with Stan uh, and Steve both that they work as a, as a pair, of course, and they are well-timed. They know exactly what they want to do in there. And, of course, now when you see the Sheep Herders are outside of the ring, it does break down that momentum. But I'm sure with the experience that Steve and Stan both have and the current holders of the United States Tag Team title, we're going to see quite a bit of action. They'll uh, try their best. Another milk kick back to the chest, and it is a Stan Lane using uh, 
those uh, rear tight savant blows very, very effectively to the midsection. And so the sheep herder tags up. Now it will be out to uh, sheep herder number two to move into the ring. The United States Tag Team Championships on the line. Steve Kern tags up Kern, side headlock, and, uh, well, I think uh, Kern is going to fight fire with fire, but he's caught in a uh, head scissors now by the sheep herder. Lane, trying to power his way out of it. Does so indeed, and then uh, drives that uh, knee into the quadricep morris muscles of the sheep herder, and then uh, a little bit of a two-way banana split there, and the sheep herder mighty anxious to tag up, and that's exactly what he does. Well, Garden, the, the Fabulous Ones are one of the best well-groomed tag teams in the country right now. And, of course, uh, they happened to gain that title as the United States Tag Team uh, Champion uh, not that long ago in a tournament involving the Sheep Herders. And the Sheep Herders definitely have that on their mind. They are upset. They have been upset for some time about that. They want that title, no doubt about it. And that's exactly what they're out to get uh, this evening in this uh, championship match. One fall, 30-minute time limit. I've been watching uh, both uh, Stan Wayne and Steve Kern uh, this past week getting ready for this match. They've been doing a lot of running in the surf here at Daytona Beach. And, of course, all I can tell you about Daytona Beach, the finest surf in the world, no question about that. Interesting move there, Gordon. I've not seen the two of them do this, but uh, I would imagine in a championship, a title match like this, you're going to see some different things that uh, we uh, don't normally get a chance to see with the fabulous ones. Well, they're going to let out all the stops, no question about it, and that's exactly what they're doing right now. And uh, their teamwork and coordination is uh, really beginning to pay off now. Inside step over by Kern and locks down. And that, once again, puts a lot of pressure on that upper thigh. And so, the sheep herder. Well, it's almost as if uh, Steve happened to uh, know all about the fact that the sheep herders like to break rules. And Steve's uh, got some ideas of his own in mind. Having a little uh, finger sandwich there for a moment. <laughs> and it is Stan Lane moving back inside. So, they're concentrating now on the left leg of the sheep herder. And if they can wear down, of course, either one of those legs, uh, they contain the strongest muscles in the body. They'll take away a point of offense, a point of defense, and a point of balance. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. Well, Stan looked like he was making a tackle on the fullback at that point, but he didn't quite get all the way through. But it's interesting to note with uh, both Stan and Steve, they are so well trained, so well in, in physical shape on this. It's going to be a great, uh, great match. I know that. And the sheep herders uh, doing some double teaming here very quickly. And now a, a judo chop to the back of the neck, the base of the skull of uh, Stan Lane. Irish whip off the ropes. Missed with that uh, lariat, and Lane retaliates very nicely. And so, it is Lane. Swinging the gauntlet, if you ah uh ah, -uh, missed that time at the uh, ring post right over our heads here at our vantage point at the ring. And again, the uh, sheep herder gets him in the side headlock and makes the tag. And I'll tell you what, uh, these teams are about even in punishment being meted up. Well, I would say you're correct about that, Gordon. I just happened to notice that, of course, looking at the sheep herders who, the moment I thought was going to be in my lap, but I'll tell you, they definitely, in my mind, do not have any idea exactly a plan of attack. You cannot read that on their mind, whereas with Stan and Steve, it's as if they've got a well-planned out attack that they're uh, ready to instill into the sheep herders although it's not happening at this moment right now it's stan lane in trouble in that five far corner five minutes and uh you could hear the uh, voice of the uh, timekeeper just then it appears we're five minutes into this match and they are still punishing uh stan lane in the corner Steve Kern walking over, uh, shouting a bit of encouragement to Stan. Stan now trying to get over there to make that tag, but not quite soon enough. Thumb to the throat now by the sheep herder on lane. So the sheep herder's plan is now beginning to surface because he's beginning to uh, beginning to go for uh, the air supply to uh, the fabulous ones. Concentrating on the throat, the upper chest, trying to take away that supply of oxygen. Now, percussions to the back, and once again, that affects the lungs. What the fuck is that? Off the ropes. Ooh. Audie coming in, and Lane is in trouble. 
Bain came out of it. Those eyes were rolling, however, and he's got some uh, some serious problems now. And so this early in the match, the U.S. Uh, heavyweight tag team championship. But wait a minute, he ducks away from it. Caught him with his own lariat coming off the ropes. A bit of his own medicine. It's kind of interesting, Gordon, that uh, Stan Lane has been has been inside the ring for so long. Steve's been trying to get his attention right now. It's almost as he is in a daze. He's not quite certain where he needs to go to make that tag. He's trying his best right now, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Ah, he does get that tag. He made the tag, but uh, 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 referee was not aware of it. Referee was not aware of the tag, and so now it is Kern being caught and being sent back. Ooh, he's outside the ring. Jumped outside the ring. Wait a second. Uh oh He's got that, ooh, caught him with the butt of that flag. Stan Lane in trouble as he was caught with the butt of that flag. Wait a minute. Steve Kern. Uh-oh. Steve Kern just rolled Lane out of the ring. And uh, you've got a question of which man is which is right inside that ring, but don't worry about that right now. Kern had tagged up. And now watch... Kern comes up, the sheep herder. He's got him. Beautiful inside cradle. And he's got he got him. He got him an inside cradle by Steve Kern. And so the fabulous ones retain the U.S. Tag Team Championship. The sheep herders turn back in their challenge for the title. There you see them, a jubilant pair here at the Ocean Center at Daytona Beach, Florida. Stan Lane and Steve Kern are still the U.S. Tag Team Champions. At a weight of 222 pounds, Tim Horner. His opponent, he hails from the Orient. At a weight of 222 pounds, he is accompanied to the ring by Kendo Nagasaki, the ninja. This is the United States heavyweight title is on the line one fall with a 30 minute time limit u.s junior heavyweight championship on the line tim horner in the blue trunks uh the teal blue trunks actually going up against the ninja and uh i'll tell you what tim horner has been defending that uh, junior title all around the united states and uh, Stan, I think we're in for one heck of a battle here between these two. The Ninja from Japan, just an outstanding young athlete. No doubt about that, Gordon. Uh, Tim Horner is known as White Lightning. He is from Tennessee, and uh, I might say this much about the Ninja. Being from the Orient, I've tried my best to talk to him a couple of times in interviews. He does not speak a lot of English, but he does communicate quite well in the ring. No doubt about that. There's... Yeah. He said a mouthful there. Beautiful uh, go behind uh, Duck Hunter takedown a few moments ago. Ah, nice reversal here by Horner. And another reversal by the Ninja. Dropped hold out of that by Tim Horner. And the Ninja backed on his feet into his man. Suddenly realized he was in possible trouble and backed away. Well, the Ninja is very swift. Uh, I've not had a chance to see Tim Horner, but uh, having the uh, title as the uh, White Lightning, he certainly has got to be very quick, and he is showing that. He is indeed. We saw a shot of Kendo Nagasaki, his mentor, Ninja's mentor, outside the ring watching his man. Kendo Nagasaki recently reinstated. Beautiful move as Horner countered him, and the Ninja caught high, high hip toss. Nice countering move. You've got two young athletes, and of course in the junior heavyweight division, you'll see these men go to the air a bit more. Uh, than you will in your uh, super heavyweight division. 
So these two fellows are used to uh, those high-flying drop kicks, uh, those rolls. Full on drag and twist now by the Knicks. Both are excellent athletes, and one thing I, I, I'm looking to, to see in this particular match with the Ninja, he does spend quite a bit of time in the air, you might say. Very quick, uses the feet and the hands, a lot of uh, the martial arts ability with him. And of course, over in the corner is Kendo Nagasaki, and uh, we don't necessarily can understand some of the instructions that he might or may not receive from that corner, but I'm sure that he does. Good fireman carry takedown just a moment or two ago, and then uh, two counter moves here as the Ninja tried to break three, and it was uh, Tim Horner, the U.S. Junior Heavyweight Champion. Hanging in there, hanging tough now. Bars the arm once again. This match has uh, some great international flavor to it. Aha, the Ninja brings him up. Full body slam, but Horner hung right in. I he, think Tim is deciding that he wants to go to work on that left shoulder. He uh, seems to feel that uh, perhaps that might be a strength of... Uh, of the ninja and he's going to go to work on it right now kind of soften him up for later uh well make his move a little bit later on well exactly if you concentrate on one point of the body and finally beginning to weaken that down and of course in wrestling there are four very salient points uh, the two arms the two legs and of course then you have the head making the fifth point so uh in this case as you say concentrating on that shoulder and uh, that arm oh beautiful move by the ninja First drop kick coming from behind, and uh, Tim Horner caught now in a high backdrop, and so Horner, and Horner is not the kind to come into a match overconfident at all. He is a very, very conservative competitor in that respect. But brother, he has had his eyes open a couple of times so far, Stan. Well, he certainly has, but one thing I must say, he is living up to his title, White Lightning. He quickly rebounds. He finds himself perhaps uh, being the bottom man, and he uh, quickly comes up with a counter move to get himself on top again, and that's exactly where he is right now. I know the folks who are watching us in uh, New Orleans right now have seen Tim Horner in action many, many times in the past, as uh, those of you in uh, Dallas and Houston and Fort Worth have seen uh, this young fellow in action. He has uh, been defending the title all over the United States, facing, I think, his toughest challenge uh, uh, thus far in this man, the Ninja. Truly a superior athlete, uh, one of the all-time greats. Uh, 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 may have, no, sir. No, sir. Double cradle, but he got away from it. Full arm drag and uh, twist once again now into an arm bar. And so now look at the, uh, the intensity on the face of uh, Tim Horner as he realized he's in for a fight of his life. It's interesting you noted that i uh, of course from our ringside vantage point here watching the ninja been an opportunity to watch him many times usually a very cool customer you do not read a lot of well a lot of emotion on his face at all but i am noticing in this particular match that he has uh, got quite a match on his hand with tim horner perhaps a little bit more than he anticipated ninja trying here for a sleeper hold and of course the sleeper hold was originated uh, uh, in Japan, and uh, he tried for it and was unable to get it clamped down properly. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Uh-uh, getting some extra leverage here. It was a little bit difficult for the referee to see this. He's got him a little bit camouflaged with his legs uh, scissored around his neck along with that, I'm not certain what it is, from his wrist of the ninja. Well, it looked like it was a piece of tape or uh, a tuggy cord or something, but... Uh, Referee now definitely calling for a break. Ninja, of course, uh, has that language barrier, and he can kind of use that to his advantage, but he ought to know the signals well enough when a referee points to him and uh, indicates a break. Well, this certainly gives a new dimension to the sleeper hold, no doubt about that. He has hidden whatever the object is that he has applied pressure. We can tell from our vantage point, Tim Horner's face is turning extremely red. That pressure being applied to his, uh, to his neck. And that, of course, would indicate a choke as opposed to a sleeper because uh, uh, in that sleeper, the uh, blood supply to the head is cut off uh, as you uh, cut down that carotid artery. So this definitely appears to be a choke where the oxygen is being cut away from it and yep wrapping it around his wrist once again and Horner in trouble Horner catching a thrust into the throat now by the ninja the ninja catching him again Horner in dire straits here in a wow high vertical suplex. 
Well, it's interesting to know that even after all of that and having that pressure on his neck and his throat, he was still able to power out of that. Tim Horner is quite a competitor, no doubt about that, considering he had that, uh, we're not certain what it is, that uh, twine, uh, tape, whatever it was, wrapped around and uh, stretched between uh, both his left hand and right hand of the ninja around his neck. Well, it was something, it, it looks like it was part of the tape and then it came loose and it is still hanging there. At the moment, the ninja does not appear to be taking advantage of it, but once again, notice the way the forearm is coming across that carotid artery. And so it is uh, Horner facing that kind of pressure and looking up a little imploringly, if you will, and that's not to uh, downgrade the man. No, sir, it's a look of anger now. A look of pure venom, if you will, as Horner is really facing uh, some uh, bad, bad times here at the hands of the ninja. Well, once again, the ninja is going to work on Tim Horner's neck. He has uh, been doing that most of this uh, this uh, bout, going after the neck. And I'd have to say right now, Tim Horner is not, to, even though he's responding, he's not real certain where he is other than inside of, uh, well, the squared circle. Now the pressure being applied by the foot, the right foot of the ninja, once again going to work on that neck. Horner's upper body is red and considered, but Horner fires away now with a hard right hand to the uh, chest, but then he's uh, he's caught, ripped across the eyes by the ninja, and the ninja very definitely has things beginning to go his way. There's no question about it. Horner fires again to the midsection. Ninja's down. That one upset him. And the ninja then going back to the oriental uh, method of uh, self-defense uh, and it is uh, Tim Horner, the U.S. Junior Heavyweight Champion, back on the canvas. Another point to point out here, Gordon, is the fact that the Ninja has so many things to go to. Quite a repertoire of, uh, of different moves and holds and thrusts that he can go to, perhaps more so than uh, Tim Horner, just basically because of that martial arts experience that he does have. It could be that Ninja might have a, a slight bit ed of edge in versatility here, uh, but uh, this young fellow from uh, the hills of Tennessee uh, has got one thing that I know for sure, and that's uh, an awful lot of heart. You know, they, uh, the old saying a lot of times, uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, and that may be exactly what Tim Horner has in mind right now. He catches him, an elbow into the uh, solar plexus, another elbow into the midsection of the ninja, and a clubbing forearm to the side of the jaw of the ninja, and that one may have, been, may have been a bit of the fist as well as the forearm, as Horner now is beginning to retaliate back in kind against the ninja. I think you're right, Gordon. I did notice a little bit of a clenched fist on that. No doubt, he is upset and angry at some of the things that have taken place to him in this particular match. And he is going to go to work on uh, the ninja. I think he's taken about all the punishment uh, and all of the uh, tactics that he wants off the ninja. Caught him with a good drop kick coming off the ropes. No, sir. Ninja powers out. And so it is Horner. Bringing him back up once again, trying to set him for a vertical souffle. Has him a beautiful vertical souffle by uh, Tim Horner, the U.S. Junior Heavyweight Champion. And again, Ninja powers out. Well, Tim's been able to get the two count, but he has not as yet gotten the three count. He Down is off the... Uh-oh. Off the ropes, and it appeared... It appeared that Kendo Nagasaki fought Tim Horner. It happened so rapidly, it was difficult to ascertain. But the ninja, somehow Horner in trouble. The ninja up on those ropes. High backflip comes over on it has the three count he has the three count the ninja the ninja has just won the u.s junior heavyweight the championship time, 10 minutes and 26 seconds the winner and new united states junior heavyweight champion the ninja you just heard the official word from our uh, ringside the timekeeper the new United States Junior Heavyweight Champion is the Ninja. We'll be back with the AWA title in a moment. In just a minute... 
Waiting now for the appearance of Nick, Wa Nick Bockwinkle, the AWA champion. And what a champion he is. Entering the uh, ring area now, though. Here comes Kendo Nagasaki, the challenger. Ladies and gentlemen, now entering the ring, he is accompanied by his manager, Sir Oliver Humperdinck. From the Far East, at a weight of 240 pounds, the master of the kendo stick, Kendo Nagasaki. He is now entering the ring. He is the AWA heavyweight champion. He hails from Los Angeles, California, at a weight of 244 pounds, Dick Bockwinkle! One fall with a 30-minute time limit. The AWA heavyweight title is on the line. Kendo Nagasaki now... Uh... There's that strange green mist that comes uh, from his mouth every time he steps into the ring. Nick Bockwinkle, a man who has held the AWA title longer than any other champion and more times than any other champion, four times in all, a total of nine years. He is indeed a tough, tough individual. He's wrestled them all, he's wrestled the finest, and uh, he is facing one of the finest from Japan right now. Well, this will be an interesting match. Uh, Gordon, I must say in that last match, uh, of course, the Ninja is uh, with Sir Oliver Humperdinck and uh, part of his shock troops. Kind of an interesting situation that did take place. We only just got a brief glimpse of it, but it had to do with the kendo stick. I'm sure we're going to be finding out more about that, and it may have uh, very well cost Tim Horner his title in that last match. But right now, and as we are hearing the stick being pounded very closely to us right now, well, of course, uh, the, the, uh, that last match will go under review by the NWA. They will be reviewing that particular match to see if indeed there was any outside interference. But at the moment, as it stands, uh, Tim Horner has lost the U.S. junior title. But AWA champion Nick Bockwinkle now has Nagasaki, the man who may have been responsible for Ninjas winning that title. He has Nagasaki on the campus. Remember, once again, this is one fall, 30-minute time limit. Sir Oliver Humperdinck recently reinstated by uh, Kendo Nagasaki. Nagasaki, of course, uh, CEO of uh, Hiroshima Limited. Well, Gordon, one thing I might point out here, and uh, Sir Oliver Humperdinck certainly has got to be feeling very good about right now the fact that the Ninja won in that match against Tim Horner. The fact that uh, perhaps he's getting that uh, champagne chilled down just a little bit sooner than he thought he might. He's looking right now for Kendo Nagasaki to again be a winner. Part of the shock troops winning in this particular match going up against Nick Bockwinkle, the AWA championship on the line. Excellent point, I'll tell you what. I want to be very careful with a man like Bockwinkle. He is a second generation uh, competitor. His father was a great, great wrestler. Unfortunately, he passed away this past March. I had a chance to uh, chat a few moments uh, before match time with uh, Nick, and I've never seen him looking in better shape in his entire life. A uh, tremendously bright man. Nagasaki, however, doesn't care about any of that. Good single leg pickup by uh, Bockwinkle, and then Bockwinkle coming down on the side of the rib cage. Jimmy Jeff, the referee. Fine young uh, official. Now this will be interesting because Kendo Nagasaki will let out all stops in order to win this title. I'm sure this has got to be quite a match for him in terms of gaining the AWA championship. But just the same, you mentioned before that uh, Nick Bockwinkle has held this title many, many times over the, the past uh, many years. And uh, he is certainly a veteran. He is going to do everything he can to hang on to it. So it will be an interesting match. And uh, both are really feeling each other out at this moment, I must say. Well, and a lot riding on the line for the man you see pacing back and forth across the ring. Uh, he was in view just a moment or two ago. I'm referring, of course, to Sir Oliver Humberdink there. An excellent close-up of uh, Kendo Nagasaki, who... Uh, 
is an awesome warrior indeed. Again, some great international flavor in this match. Bachwinkel, Los Angeles, California, now residing in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And by the way, we certainly want to say hi to uh, all of the good folks along the line in uh, Minneapolis. And uh, I know you're wishing uh, your champion well at this point in time. Well, right now, it's interesting. Kendo Nagasaki perhaps taking a few moments of uh, inspiration, maybe some notation, some things that the second pair of eyes outside of the ring are perhaps noticing, and that is through Sir Oliver Humperdinck. And uh, he, by the way, is the gatekeeper of that kendo stick, so we're going to have to keep a close eye on that, Gordon. Yeah, if it did, in fact, have a uh, anything to do with the loss of the U.S. junior title to Tim Horner, I might just point out, in case anyone has a question, why would they be allowed to bring the kendo stick to ringside? The kendo stick is, indeed, a legitimate sporting item in Japan. Uh, they use the kendo stick in fencing, uh, or as a substitute for fencing, as you would uh, here in the United States or in France. Uh, they duel with the kendo sticks, and so it is a part and parcel of uh, Kendo Nagasaki and the ninja and uh, the Japanese wrestlers who are trained in those particular arts. Kendo Nagasaki now with a uh, reverse head scissors now on uh, Nick Bockwinkle. And Bockwinkle slips away from it. Good move by the wily AWA champion. Well, he's showing that he is definitely a veteran, no doubt about that, Gordon. His moves and his counter moves to Kendo Nagasaki perhaps has got Kendo uh, a little bit uh, perplexed at this moment, grabbing a hold of the bottom row. in the match, five minutes. As we have just heard, five minutes have elapsed in this match. 30-minute time limit. Nagasaki beginning to let out some stops here now as he may have felt he's found a weakness in the AWA champion Nick Bockwinkle. And Bockwinkle could be in trouble on those ropes and Bockwinkle battered against the uh, ring ropes and the ring posts and a series of blows into the chest of Nick Bockwinkle. Bockwinkle now Irish whip into the far turn buckle and caught once again by uh, Kendo Nagasaki and now Bockwinkle hurtled from the ring. And uh, this may be a stellar night uh, for uh, Hiroshima Limited, Kendo Nagasaki, the ninja, and Sir Oliver Humperdinck. No doubt about that, Gordon. I know that Sir Oliver Humperdinck, he uh, told me not that long ago that that is something he would not like any better than to be able to walk away with all of his all of his members of the shock troops winning, taking titles. And so far it has happened right now. We're not certain what's going to happen. Uh, quite a competition here between Nick Bockwinkle and Kendo Nagasaki. Nick is feeling a little bit poorly after being tossed out of the ring, but he's got an excellent move there. Cross body block by uh, Bachwinkle, but uh, it is Nagasaki being caught again and Bachwinkle beginning to explode. Bachwinkle really beginning to power away now at Kendo Nagasaki. Irish whip into the uh, ring post and a high, high backdrop by Nick Bachwinkle. Bachwinkle. Beautifully executed drop kick has Kendo Nagasaki. Dropped again now Nagasaki up against those ring ropes and it's Bachwinkle closing in on him. Bachwinkle a clubbing right hand to the side of the jaw. Well, it's interesting. Uh, Kevin Nagasaki is staggered at this moment. He's kind of out of breath. He is definitely a little bit worse for wear here at this moment. Nick Bachwinkle was taking the better for the beating here. Just a few moments ago. Oh! A trip up here. A trip up. And referee Jimmy Jet calling for the bell. Referee Jimmy Jet calling for the bell as there was a trip up. Well, Kendo Nagasaki at this moment is not really aware of what is taking place. I don't believe he got up with his arms raised thinking he had taken the title. That's right, but that is not the case. That is not the case. The After referee... Seven minutes of wrestling time, the ninja... Excuse me. Kendo Nagasaki is disqualified. The winner and still champion, Nick Bockwinkle. Well, we've got a battle going on between the two, but Nick Bockwinkle is indeed still the AWA champion. We'll be back with more action after we pause. I'm Henry Steele.
into the ring, accompanied by their manager, Paul Ellering, and the thousands jamming the Ocean Center are going absolutely berserk. Introducing first with their manager, Sir Oliver Humperdinck, at a combined weight of 730 pounds, the challenger is the Shock Troops. Introducing their opponents with precious Paul Ellering. He is proud to present at a combined weight of 585 pounds, Animal and Hulk, the Road Warriors. One fall with a 30-minute time limit. One fall, 30-minute time limit, Ed the Bull Gantner and Kareem Muhammad moving out against the Road Warriors. They're not waiting. No, sir. Precious Paul Ellering. of the uh, shock troops and the road warriors uh, championship wrestling has uh, instructed several of the competitors who have already competed tonight to stand by in the event they are needed uh, to quell possible problems here because uh, when you put four such dynamos as Ed the Bull Gettner and Kareem Mohammed against the hawk and the animal You've got Sir Oliver Humperdinck on one side, Precious Paul Ellering on the other. Brother, you talk about uh, St. Helena's explosion. We're liable to have one, and so far we have. No doubt about that, Gordon. I would have to imagine Sir Oliver Humperdinck is quite upset about this. He did not expect this. This was his last chance to really try and get another title, was to have his shock troops, tremendous athletes, Ed the Bulgander and Kareem Mohammed just come in here and waylay on the Road Warriors, but it... Uh, is backfiring on him, I must say that. All right. The Animal and Kareem Mohammed and some uh, commentary between uh, Precious Paul Ellering. Ellering has an interesting background indeed. Right now it's the Animal. Wow, brother. Well, sir, that was like hitting a redwood tree. It shook him a little, but he did not go down, and so now the Animal has to be looking at and uh, Kareem Muhammad could not put the animal down either. Well, now, Kareem Muhammad's got to be thinking again. Usually that kind of move will, will move somebody of his size, at least 250 pounds, right out of the way. But he stood tall against Kareem Muhammad, well over 300 pounds. Now it's Ed the Bull Gantner moving out against the Hawk. And both men locking up, and neither man able to gain any advantage. Between those two, you've got about 530 pounds colliding. And uh, it is right now Ed the Bull Gantner getting a slight edge on the Hawk. But how long that'll be? Also a reversal by the Hawk. And the Hawk caught him with a lariat coming off. Gantner drops to the canvas. And they caught each other and both men are down. That's like putting two Sherman tanks against each other at 30 miles an hour and see what happens. Well, Ed the Bull Gantner, tremendous muscle definition. And he is a tremendous athlete, but uh, in terms of being matched up against the uh, Road Warriors, another matter. Although, he's got a great hold right now. A bear hug on uh, the animal. And you can see Kareem Muhammad, he's really getting fired up now. And Sir Oliver Humperdinck marching around the ring as uh, Ed the Bull Gantner keeps the bear hug on the animal. Sir, the animal finally utilizing those 22 inch arms is able to break it up and here comes Kareem Muhammad Muhammad one to the midsection brings him up full body slam on the animal well Kareem Muhammad right now chastising the animal a little bit trying to get some approval looks in something we don't have a well a great opportunity to hear it backfired Gordon it did indeed Look at this man bring up over 400 pounds. The animal. 
dumped over that top rope by uh, at the Bull Gantner, and we've got a battle going on outside the ring. Kareem Muhammad's not quite certain what's going on, although now he's got the eye of the animal and the hawk both outside the ring. Well, he could have a count out here if we're not careful. No. Uh-oh. Versus Paul Ellering getting a few licks in there to Ed, Bull, Ed the Bull Gander. Well, he was quite a wrestler himself uh, before he uh, took over this team and uh, was, of course, a world-class weightlifting champion as well. But right now, Ed the Bull Gantner moves back in, double sledge to the back. Right in the Jurassic area of uh, the animal. Catches him again. Now, right between the shoulder blades. Gantner really uh -oh. late. Well, Sir Oliver Humperdinck, uh, is nothing unusual for him. He's going to stick his uh, nose in there wherever he can, that's for sure. Well, it's interesting that uh, both Kareem and Ed Gander have been going to work Five on the animal. In the match. Five minutes. But here in the timekeeper, five minutes has expired thus far in this match. One fall, 30-minute time limit. Kareem Muhammad crashes down the big splash, but the animal rolled away from it. Makes the tag with the hawk, and the hawk moves in. And if it's possible, the action is picking up even more. Drop kick coming off. But Kareem Muhammad, they've found a way to get him off his feet. They've got him up again. Another full body slam. He came down on the point of his shoulder that time. Very close to his head, Gordon, on that one. That one could have been a very devastating move to Kareem Muhammad. Off the ropes once again. Flying headbutt coming off the ropes. Ed the Bull Gantner breaks it up from behind. And it's uh, the animal after him as the Hawk is after uh, Kareem Muhammad. We've got all four men in the ring at the same time. You've got a half a ton of... Uh, Tough raw beef right there, and it was uh, the referee being shoved to one side. Now the referee, Bill Alfonso, trying to uh, restore some uh, law and order here if he can. And uh, still all four in the ring. Well, he's tried several times to break up this match, get things back in order. He's called in more support here, two additional referees, see if they can help out. And Gantner, and it is... Uh, the Road Warriors and uh, the Shock Group's going absolutely berserk. And there had been some fear that this might happen. The animosity between these two teams and these two managers. Ego, greed, and avarice coming to the surface here. And uh, it is a problem of trying to get some kind of order restored. Now we've and got some help coming in now. Not certain if this is help, Gordon, or it's going to be a hindrance. We'll find out shortly. Well, something's got to be done. We're going to have to break it up. I mean, everyone is out. Cowboy Ron Bass, the Sheep Herders, the Ninja. That was a question now of uh, some sort of pride here, too, is uh, one referee uh, is down and hurt. There's no question about that. And we're trying to get some kind of order restored in the ring. And obviously, no, we've got uh, Danny Miller in there. Now, the work, we'll have to get some order restored, and then we'll be back. Let's, let's break away for this message. Now. All right, getting set now. Bahamas Championship coming up. Kendall Wyndham going up against Chris Champion, the Bahamas Champion. Belt, uh, the official Bahamas Heavyweight Championship, recognized by the NWA and Championship Wrestling. Kendall Windham in the ring, in now uh, with the Red Trunks, and uh, going up against uh, the Wild Man from Tasmania. We're waiting for him to appear, and uh, we'll be having this Bahamas Championship in just a moment. One fall, 30-minute time limit. Those of you in Nassau, stand by because your champion is on his way. Kendall Windham. The youngest of the Wyndham wrestling family, and that is quite a family stand. It certainly is. One thing I was going to point out, according with the melee, it just took place just a few moments ago. Chris Champion was indeed out here as a member of that entourage trying to break up the melee going on between the Road Warriors and the Shock Troops. So he might be delayed just another moment or two before he comes out trying to catch his breath, I would imagine. He took one heck of a risk knowing that he had a title match upcoming. That, uh, 
There you see a sign from one of the uh, thousands here at the uh, Ocean Center in Daytona Beach saying Kendall is number one. An outstanding crowd uh, here this evening watching these events. And for those of you around the country, our special greetings. And now, the music, the sound, and the champion. He's in from Sweetwater, Texas, at a weight of 215 pounds, Kendall Wendell. From the Isle of Tasmania, at a weight of 222 pounds, he is the current Bahamian champion, Chris Champion. One fall with a 30-minute time limit. The Bahamian title is on the line. All right, the referee checking with the champion very quickly now, making sure that he removes his uh, outer garb and, of course, takes off that belt. Great opportunity here for young Kendall Wyndham, the youngest, as we said, of the Ken uh, Kendall the Wyndham wrestling uh, clan. He is an older brother, Barry Wyndham, going after that Florida title, currently held by Cowboy Ron Baz. Champion, an extremely uh, cocky young man, if you will, Stan. Well, Gordon, I had an opportunity to talk with him tonight, and uh, he bestowed me not too many weeks ago with his own VIP identity card. And once again, he wanted to know why I did not have it on my uh, person. I told him that I was polishing it up, but nonetheless, uh, when he came out, you would have thought instead of the Bahama heavyweight champion, he was the president of the Bahamas. Yeah, but he claims they're going to have an election for him. <laughs> no doubt. All right, champion very quickly complaining to referee Jimmy Jett. Kendall Wyndham is all business. He's a very, very dedicated young athlete. He had an opportunity uh, for, to go uh, on to school to several colleges or turn professional, and uh, he said, I can get my education later, but uh, the lure of the money right now is a bit much for Kendall, and so he uh, has turned professional. Well, no doubt about it, Gordon. Kendall is quite a competitor, even though he's... Uh, perhaps a little bit small in size. He has put on a lot of weight and stature. And I think perhaps he uh, might have Chris Champion uh, a little bit bulldog, you might say. Chris uh, perhaps thinking he's got an easy match here, but not quite the, not quite the case. Champion with a uh, look of newfound respect on his face just now. And it's Kendall Wyndham outside the ring and Champion on the run. Champion off the ropes. Comes up and it's with high, high hip toss. Uh-oh. Well, I think, Chris, uh, you're right, Gordon. Definitely newfound respect for Kendall Wyndham. I think Chris uh, thought he had a little bit of a cakewalk uh, for this particular match, but it, defending any title, and particularly the Bahama heavyweight title, Chris Champion has got a lot of work cut out for him if he thinks he's going to take that and keep that title. And it's Kendall Wyndham hurdled out, uh, hurdled outside, and so it is uh, the battle outside the ring now, outside of camera range now, back into view. And it is uh, Chris Champion, full body slam on Kendall Wyndham. Champion insolently moving back into the ring and uh, throwing out those arms to indicate that he is indeed the champion. Kendall Wyndham coming in laboriously slow. Champion right after them, flat of the foot to the back of the head. Now, uh, Kendall Wyndham delivered uh, one to the midsection. And a lot of people forget that Kendall Wyndham was uh, a Texas Golden Glove champion, Stan. Well, he's showing that right now with a couple of left hooks to Chris Champion's face. He definitely is uh, doing his best to get his attention. One thing I've noticed, among other things, and now Kendall Wyndham is awfully upset, and he's given his words of advice to Chris Champion. The adrenaline is flowing now with Kendall Wyndham, and Wyndham has him up a full body slam and champion in trouble. 
the Bahamas title, and we could see another title changing here just momentarily. He's going for the Bulldog. Oh! Champion fired uh, Kendall Wyndham right into the referee. Fired him right into him. And it's Wyndham going for the Bulldog once again. Has him in the Bulldog. Wait a minute, let's see what's going on here. Champion, champion apparently disqualified. Very irate Kendall Wyndham over this situation, though. Well, Kendall Wyndham wins the match, but he, uh, he does not gain the belt. Wins the match, does not gain the belt. Disqualification, but I can't blame the referee after what just occurred. With the Road Warriors, they couldn't afford to take any further chances. Tough break, but uh, now speaking of breaks, that's what we're going to do. We'll be back. In a tough situation... Uh, for uh, Kendall Wyndham just a moment ago as he tried to uh, win that Bahamas championship. And, of course, as we said, we're live here from the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, Florida, where we will be seeing Lex Luger going up against the world heavyweight champion, uh, Ric Flair. Let's take a look once again, if we may, at that situation. Watch here and uh, Stan, this is the uh, the situation. Watch him as he jams him into the, into the uh, ring post. Now, Kendall Wyndham catches him with the Bulldog once again. The referee has already been knocked down, knocked to one side, and it is Wyndham definitely getting a pinfall here. No doubt, he has the three pin count here, but obviously the referee is not uh, taking that into account. He is not even counting off the three, the three count. He is calling for the bell to be rung at this point, and that's exactly what happened with the uh, disqualification for the title match here. And it had to be that way, in my opinion. Uh, after what happened with the shock troops and the road warriors, obviously the officials could not afford to get the uh, emotions so inflamed that we could have had uh, another uh, precipitous uh, near riot, if you will. So, uh, consequently, uh, I think the referee acted uh, in the very, very best interest of both competitors. Uh, but I have a hunch, Dan, that those two will be meeting each other again one day. No doubt about it. Chris has uh, been putting the title up on the line some time now. And I'm sure Kendall, very hungry, very anxious, and quite a competitor, he's looking forward to that opportunity to take that Bahama Heavyweight Championship. And once again, we will be reviewing, or at least the NWA Board of Directors will be reviewing that uh, controversial situation regarding the United States Junior Heavyweight Championship. Kendo Nagasaki. I don't know what he's going to do with Sir Oliver Humperdinck. He may have some more problems there. Uh, Sir Oliver definitely cost him the AWA title against uh, Nick Bockwinkle. But we're waiting now for the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, four times champion, Ric Flair, going up against the man that many claim is the uh, champion, Lex Luger. And uh, we're getting set to go. Let's watch those curtains as they open. There you see him, and what a study. What a study in mass and muscles and the beautiful coordination. This man has got it all. Lex Luger coming to the ring. He is the challenger. An awesome individual. A tremendous individual, I must say that, Gordon. He's an intelligent, very intelligent individual. Talked with him on many occasions, and I'll tell you, he has got quite a following here in Florida, no doubt about that. Tremendous competitor. One that everyone has their eyes on. Well, it's the most unusual matchup coming. Three 20-minute segments, if you will. In other words, this is a two out of three falls match. Each fall is 20 minutes. So, if there are three draws, the match will go 60 minutes. But there are three 20-minute time periods. Two out of three falls. So, if the first fall is taken uh, by either man in, say, five minutes, that 20-minute segment is eliminated, and the ball goes to whomever takes it. Uh, I talked to Bob Root, who is uh, an associate of Lex Luger's uh, beforehand when this contract was coming up for signing. Bob uh, said he believed this would probably possibly go in the favor of Lex Luger and he was all for it but it was Ric Flair who insisted upon it waiting now for 
the NWA World Heavyweight Champion to come out. And this is what he's facing. 275 pounds of fighting fury in Lex Luger. Well, Gordon, I must point out, it's not uh, the first time there has been a unique contract with these two individuals. It hasn't been that long ago that there was a five-minute stipulation for a five-minute rest period between uh, pinfalls. And as we, many of us know and many do not know, there was a uh, particularly interesting situation that took place in that one five-minute rest period. It certainly did, and it cost Luger the title. There you see some of the signs that are here tonight at the Ocean Center. Bring the belt home, Lex. Bring it home to Florida. Lex Luger, five years with the Green Bay Packers. And now... The NWA champion approaching, ladies and gentlemen. There he is, Ric Flair, the NWA World Heavyweight Champion. And what a champion he is. Truly a legend in his own time. Let's watch him as he approaches the ring for perhaps the toughest battle of his entire career. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one fall with a 60-minute time limit. The NWA World Heavyweight title is on the line. He is now entering the ring. From Chicago, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, at a weight of 245 pounds, internationally known as the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, Rick Flair. This is two out of three falls for the World Heavyweight Champion. Introducing the challenger from Chicago, Illinois, at a weight of 285 pounds, Lex Luger! And so, Lex Luger has been introduced. Ric Flair in another one of his uh, really, really sensational uh, robes. Uh, he spends anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars per robe. And in a moment, you're going to see the diamond and gold World Heavyweight Championship belt, the NWA World Title belt. And Flair loosening himself up on the ropes. And hey, Rick, good to see you, my friend. Rick Flair offering a uh, quick hand before he uh, steps into battle against uh, Lex Luger. Flair, four times world champion. Brother, he is traveling with the jet set. He's in a fast crowd. He certainly is. Kind of reminded me of the original rhinestone cowboy with that robe. But I'm noticing, watching Lex Luger through all of this, Lex is ready. He is chomping at the bit. He is waiting. He's been ready for this rematch for some time. And he's just ready and waiting for that bell to ring. Remember now, this is two of three falls. 20-minute periods. 20-minute periods and a bit of psychological warfare going on between the two. The referee calls for the bell and the champion offers his hand. And so uh, Luger accepts it. So the battle is on. Three 20-minute time periods, two out of three falls. Should neither man gain a pinfall, then it would be a 60 minutes if you would see these men compete. And so Lex Luger just outpowered the champion, and the champion, a look of utter amazement. Luger's only problem that I can see is perhaps over-anxiousness. That could be his uh, uh, drawback just a little bit, Gordon, the fact that he is so over-anxious that it could be uh, perhaps that adrenaline is flowing so hard that uh, it could be a drawback. We did see him uh, throw Ric Flair back uh, onto the mat, but uh, we'll have to see. I would say just looking at Lex, he has got in his mind he wants to get this over as fast as possible. The intensity in his face as he is flexing right now, not only for the crowd, but for Ric Flair as well, who is outside of the ring. He's doing some psychological movement right now. I notice that Flair has got some pretty bad bruises around uh, the lower part of his rib cage. 
and uh, so we may be seeing in that respect physically a slightly flawed champion here and uh, that could prove to be an interesting benefit for the challenger Lex Luger. Luger is in I think the finest condition I've ever seen him of course I've never seen him in bad condition absolutely well you dropped you brought out a point there Gordon uh, the fact that uh, Ric Flair constantly is having to defend that world heavyweight championship belt but perhaps he has met some very stiff competition uh, much as the likes as uh, Lex Luger right now and he's gonna perhaps have a few more bruises before the night's over and it's Luger who outpowered him once again and so Flair has been testing Luger in my opinion and thus far he has lost every battle of strength between the two so if you were scoring it uh, from a standpoint of a uh, uh, of an analysis right now we'd have to give the strength factor to Luger uh, of course wrestling is so much more than just strength it's leverage it's a knowledge of the sport it's human chess so many other factors enter into it good top wrist lock now just awesome Gordon Lex Luger has just got that adrenaline flowing he has been powering Ric Flair for the last three minutes or so of this match throwing him onto the mat many times just then we saw that uh, wrist lock throwing him back Lex is ready and uh, he's wanting to make quick work of this he is indeed and remember though it's two out of three falls in the crowd now picking it up and it is a mixed crowd there are a lot of people here that think that Ric Flair is number one and a lot of people think that Lex Luger is number one and that issue is, a, is in the process of being settled Marshall go behind drives a knee to the midsection of Lex Luger now has him back up against the ring post Flair Ooh, brother you could hear that shot resound all the way across the uh, ocean center I think he's got Lex's attention. Lex did not like that whatsoever. I was watching in that move just before that. Ric Flair playing a little psychological ploy there, looking one direction and moving the other. And he's got his own designs. He has indeed, and once again, he catches him in the midsection. Once again, those chops into the throat. And now Flair looking with obvious disbelief, like, I can't believe this is really happening. Well, he's taking an exit stage left, you might say. He's giving himself an all, uh, just a few more minutes to kind of figure out what's going on here. He is stepping outside of the ring altogether. And away. Wait a minute. Flair. All right, psychological warfare. Flair breaking the momentum. I think that's the major point, Gordon, is to break that momentum. Rick, obviously a veteran, having held that championship title many, many times, he knows how to break up that momentum, and I think he realizes with Lex, and perhaps the last couple of times, the last time they met, this is a good benefit for him to use uh, against Lex Luger. Once again, they lock up, and uh, a test of strength between the two now. And Flair does have a deep, deep bruise to the left side of his body, just under the rib cage. And as you had mentioned earlier, of course, uh, the champion goes everywhere. But just imagine that, you know, so many nights of the week, you go somewhere, you fly into a, into a city, and you know that you're going to meet the very, very best wrestler there. So that Ric Flair does not have any kind of an easy ride. He's facing the best everywhere he goes. He certainly is, and I know, I, w I must say this much about Lex Luger, that if he indeed does happen to capture the World Heavyweight Championship, he is in the best physical shape, and as you mentioned before, we've not seen him in bad shape, but he is in excellent shape to do that kind of traveling and defend the title. Well, he'll travel uh, 300 to 400,000 miles a year, Luger up and over. And a beautiful counter by Luger has Flair to the canvas. And Flair backing away. Well, that was right to that bruised section you had pointed out where uh, Ric Flair happened to land on his left uh, lower chest. And I'm sure that he is reeling from that. Although he's not showing the pain, I would have to imagine that kind of thrust would uh, bring his attention to pain. Once again, Flair moves in. Collar and elbow once again is Luger getting the side headlock. And so... Another way of looking at this, perhaps, is that Flair, as sharp an individual as he is, 
might be looking for flaws, might be looking for uh, little chinks in the armor of one Lex Luger. He has tried him out for power, found out he's not going to be able to take him that way. So he will resort once again to uh, his, either his speed or his cunning. Ooh, oh, brother, did he catch him with a chop in the throat. A reversal by Luger. And it is uh, Luger pressing the World Heavyweight Champion high over his head. Luger is reeling. He is happy about that. And Ric Flair is in pain. No doubt about that, Gordon. A little bit of uh, perhaps a little paralysis, I might say, to his left side. Some problems here. And again, it's Luger bringing him up over his head. Another full body press. And it is Flair now, as you see Luger looking at his man in a strange look of intensity on the face of uh, this very handsome young fellow, Lex Luger. Lex has the look on him, Gordon, as if he is about to go in for the kill. He has no, he has no idea in his mind right now how much time has gone by. I don't even believe he's thinking about how many falls involved in this match. Right now he's taking one particular fall at a time and he feels close to the first one. And of course now time becomes the ally of the champion. As this match moves along deeper and deeper in and remember now each time period is 20 minutes. So a 20 minute draw is a 20 minute draw. Ooh! The champion caught him coming in, Luger. Got a fist and then he caught the flat of the foot right behind the ear. Luger coming up very slowly and uh, it is uh, Rick Flair now finding the boots into the rib cage of Lex Luger. And Luger smashed into that turnbuckle again. And now quickly the tide of this battle is beginning to turn now as Rick Flair, the champion, has taken all of this punishment and is now turning on to the offensive. He certainly has. You can hear the crowd in the background. They are stopping their feet. And the intensity has picked up a lot, Gordon. Rick Flair perhaps laying in the lurches somewhat right over top of us, running that uh, neck along the ring rope of Lex Luger. And more importantly, I think he uh, caught the eyelid or the eye across that ring rope, and that could have taken its toll on uh, Lex Luger. And if you start to obscure that vision, you've got problems. He catches him with another chop, a ripping right hand, another chop into the floor, another chop into the throat. Luger fires back, and we've got a pier sixer breaking out between these two right now, and the champion is down. It is uh, Luger closing in, and Luger begins to throw out the rule book. Luger starts to explode a series of hard right hands back of the ear. A high hip toss by the challenger. It is a challenger moving in in the black trunks on Ric Flair. An Irish whip. And it, and it is uh, the champion ducking to one side. Luger jamming a knee into that turnbuckle. And Luger's got some problems. He certainly does. He is really reeling right now. His left knee is giving him a lot of problems. And having played football, Lex, I'm sure, is maybe uh, feeling that pain a little bit more. More so than maybe having had a block or a tackle on him. Woo! Champion timed that one perfectly. He came in and popped that leg, and he's after that knee again of Lex Luger. And so, it is Luger now. A challenger, but a challenger in a lot of pain. Flair brings him up. Belly to back to play on Lex Luger. And Flair, perhaps with a bit more confidence written across his face. Now, punishing that knee even more. Ten minutes. Well, ten minutes have gone by, Gordon. It's interesting how things have gone backwards and forwards on this. Now, Ric Flair is in control of this particular uh, 20 minute time period. Lex Luger is taking a lot of punishment on that left knee. And you've got to got to say this for the champion. If you uh, catch an opponent and if he's got an injury, go for it. That may sound uh, cruel and hard, but it's uh, the name of the game is win. And it is a flare fainting to the chin and then caught uh, Luger once again with a foot to the knee. And Luger's left knee and I don't know whether it's uh, visible on camera or not, but it appears to be swelling. Once again, a terrific blow to that left knee. Ric Flair is showing his championship style and form right now, Gordon. Going to work on that. It's the figure four. He's gone for the figure four, and brother, 
Uh, Eddie Graham is the one who really put a patent on it. And Rick Flair has uh, used that patent so very, very well. Flair with a figure four. And he's trying to get Luger to concede. Luger holding out against intensive, tremendous pain. And Luger, that knee. Flair taking every advantage possible here, getting some extra leverage momentarily with that ring rope. Luger not conceding, and frankly, I think he should. I really do. He is liable to, to permanently injure that knee. He certainly is, Gordon. I can speak for it myself. I'm sure he must be feeling some of the cartilage being torn, possible lig ligament damage in that left knee, but he is sticking in there. While all while, Ric Flair is using that additional leverage on the ring rope. I really can't understand how a man could take the kind of pain that Lex Luger has to be taking at this time. And the champion in desperation grabbing those ropes once again. He got the three. He got the three count. He got uh, the three count. A very unpopular three count, I might add. The people here, seven seconds. they're very unhappy. So, Ric Flair takes the first fall in this two out of three falls match. We'll be back in 122 seconds. Mash. That certainly holds true in this, and... Uh, uh, I think Lex Luger did exactly the right thing in conceding and giving up because if not, I don't believe he would still be in the ring. I think they'd be carrying him out on a stretcher because uh, the champion had that figure four cinched down. Luger either gave up or else uh, faced possibly the end of his career. So uh, he is not uh, so, uh, so egocentric that he would allow that to happen. A good move on his part, a smart move, but he comes into this second fall at a di distinct disadvantage. Absolutely, Gordon. He spent the uh, most of that two minutes while we were away nursing that knee, and once again, Ric Flair not wasting any time, going to work on that left knee. Perhaps he has in his mind that he has done enough damage that now if he goes to work against another extremity, he can put away and keep a, a hold of that uh, World Heavyweight Championship without any, well, a whole lot of effort. He's going to work now on the head. Well, he's got a one-fall advantage right now on the chan on the uh, challenger, uh, Lex Luger. And once again, Flair concentrating on that left leg. And it is Luger rolling to one side. And as he does, Flair comes down rather resoundingly on that gluteus maximus. And uh, that's got to jar the vertebrae pretty severely. And I noticed a bit of a limp as uh, the champion came up. Blocked by Luger. Ah, here's his test of strength. Alexis Shine, he may have a bad left knee, but that right knee is still intact. The champion jammed into that turnbuckle in the crowd, going absolutely bananas now. I think the sentiment of this crowd is definitely gone now with Lex Luger. No question in my mind about it. The champion in the purple trunks. Again, catching those devastating chops into the chest and lower neck. Luger firing back. Well, it's more of a fisticuffs in here now than it is a wrestling match. Lex is letting know to Ric Flair that even though he's ailing, he's coming on strong. He's giving it all he's got now, and I can't say that I blame him. He's got to let it all hang out now or forget it, and his chance is over. <laughs> Well, he caught the champion by surprise on that one. Very close to a fall on that one, Gordon. It was indeed. And you know, a lot of detractors can make comments about uh, uh, all forms of sports. But when you get down to wrestling, it is indeed a thinking man's sport. And that's exactly what Luger now is trying to do, is outthink the champion. A collision of these two giants in the center of the ring. Luger with a beautifully executed power slam. He has he got, him. got him. He got him. He's even the score. Lex Luger. Lex Luger is just even the score, taking it with a beautiful power slam on the NWA World Champion. And 53 seconds. The winner of the second fall, Lex Luger. And we'll be back with a third and deciding fall then in this NWA World Championship match right after we pause for these important messages.
20 minutes of time now separating uh, Lex Luger from the NWA World Heavyweight Championship or a retention of the title by Ric Flair and Flair and I am not surprised Flair immediately stalling for time Flair down in that corner stalling for time he knows now that time is his ally and that uh, that is the mark of why this man is four times world champion well it's interesting to know that after the uh, first fall it was Lex Luger who was feeling pretty bad was unable to walk around even trying to uh, extend that knee and now at the end of the second fall in which it is even one one apiece it was Ric Flair who was uh, kind of begging for a little bit more time there a little bit of mercy and Luger although he is moving uh, remarkably well has got his problems with that leg he is not as steady on that leg as he could be and I'll tell you what uh, and you know how many times you can uh, sprain an ankle mess up a knee or what have you if you're in the heat of competition uh, you don't notice it but the next day brother that's when you're not able to walk hey beautiful oh Flair Gamble and lost on this one Flair Gamble and lost came up on the ropes thought with that knee the way it was that he would be able to uh, crush him underneath and Luger with that fantastic upper body strength uh, turned the tide on him very close Gordon Lex Luger is going to work right now on Ric Flair twice now he's gotten the two count very very close to that world heavyweight championship I'm sure he can just feel it smell it and uh, breathe it well, you can feel it in the air now the intensity uh, in this uh, beautiful ocean center is at an all-time high and it is uh, Lex Luger keeping that bear hug on the champion and he's right around with that very very bad bruise just under the rib cage of the champion Ric Flair. So that's got to be putting added, uh, added pain to the champion. I was going to mention, Gordon, that perhaps Lex Luger during that uh, last break had an opportunity to identify and see that particular bruise. May be the reason he is going with that uh, particular move against uh, Ric Flair to give him more pain. Ric is in tremendous amount of pain. He is not, he's not uh, grabbing his side, as you might imagine, but he is in a lot of pain. He is indeed, and now, but look at Flair, the champion that he is coming after his man. And that's one thing about Ric Flair, he'll bring the battle to you. Great, great athlete, no question about it. Well, you don't gain that title four different times. Oh, brother, a lariat by the challenger. Oh, almost a count of three. A heartbeat away from that World Heavyweight Championship. You could feel everyone holding their breath on that count, Gordon. Right at the end of count two, everyone took a deep breath, wanting to let out a cheer, but it didn't come about. Champion, oh, all the way outside of the ring at this, at this time. Over the top rope, but it looks like Flair trying to call for, uh, let's watch it carefully here, Flair coming Five up. Five minutes. Five minutes. Fifteen minutes remaining now in this uh, third and final fall the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, I think he kind of got Lex Luger a little false security there. Rick was looking like he was having a lot of trouble coming back into the ring and quickly... Uh-oh. Each man vying for a backslide if he can get it and it looks like Luger... Look, no, sir. Flair rolls the shoulder away and that's where the years of experience in the ring just paid off for uh, Rick Flair. Now back with an elbow into the top of the head and smashes Luger. So Flair beginning to change his strategy now. He's headhunting now. And it is Flair, the champion, hurtling Lex Luger, hoping, I am sure, to do some additional damage to that knee if he can. Well, this has brought the crowd to their feet, Gordon. Rick Flair right now. Getting ready to fight Lex Luger with the uh, table right next to our ring here. Very close to the camera. said before he's headhunting now literally <laughs> and Luger coming up very very slowly well it was just a few moments ago it was Lex Luger helping Rick Flair into the ring and now it's just the other way around tables have turned this is a seesaw battle Gordon Front face lock now and uh, an underhook on the arm and Flair trying for that pinning combination utilizing that foot on the rope trying to get the extra leverage and again, 
Luger able to power away from it. And Luger, I can't tell whether he's just developed a massive bruise on that uh, leg or whether it's dirt that he may have picked up uh, from outside the ring. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on it. It is on that left leg that he did uh, take a lot of damage to the left knee. A massive discoloration there, but uh, it's difficult to tell. I believe, I believe, however, that it is perhaps just something that was uh, uh, picked up from contact on the floor outside the ring. Power out again, and the great upper body strength of Lex Luger uh, proves itself once again. Tremendous hit to the chest, Gordon. Each time we hear that, we're very close to the ring. I can almost feel myself shake from it. Rick Flair has been doing a lot of damage to Lex Luger. Ah, what's too many he went to the well, Gordon. Exactly, and it is uh, Flair, the champion now, who could be in trouble as Lex Luger moves in on him, and Lex Luger deciding to pay back in kind some of the treatment he's had. He's dragging that leg outside the ring, smashing it on the outside of the ring apron. And so Luger, who has had tremendous pain in his own uh, left leg, now retaliating against the right leg of the World Heavyweight Champion, Ric Flair. Flair coming back to his feet. Moving in on Luger as he comes through the ropes. And Luger in trouble on the ring apron. Referee Bill Alfonso. Warning the champion, and now it is Luger trying to come back inside. Luger up and over his man, trying to bring him back. Trying to bring him back, trying to get those legs up. Flair. Grab those ropes. He's got very close. Thought he had him. We were within a hair on having a new world champion right then. Very close to that. It was interesting just before Lex Luger went into that particular move. Or eyesight caught it. It was interesting to see the intensity in his mind. He wants it. He is hungry, Gordon. He is indeed, and 50% of the time has been. Uh, uh, taken up right now so far. Ten minutes remaining in this 20-minute time here. And it's the sleeper hold. It is the sleeper hold. And this is what Flair has been waiting for. One mistake. He caught the chink in the armor of uh, Lex Luger, the challenger. And it's Rick Flair with the sleeper hold. And this, I'm afraid, is going to be all she wrote for Lex Luger, the challenger. Well, I think you might be right, Gordon. Right now, the crowd going nuts. They're stomping their feet as if they might be able to arouse... Lex Luger very close to being out here in this sleeper hold by Ric Flair. He is fighting it off. But the champion is exactly that, Gordon. He knows that he was just waiting for that opportune moment to find that chink in the armor, and he, I believe, may have done so. Luger in a world of trouble now, and the referee once again, Bill Alfonso Luger, slowly sinking to the canvas, and... Uh, Blackness may be settling in. No, sir, he's got that arm up. He is indicating. The referee checked to see if that arm was limp. It was not, and look at Luger. Both men are sweating profusely. It's hard to keep a grip like that, I would imagine, Gordon. And that perhaps might have been to the benefit of Lex Luger trying to get out of that hole, that he did. I think you have an excellent point there, Stan, and it's the champion down champion in a lot of problems here but I think you're exactly right I think Blair was having trouble cinching down with that figure uh, with the uh, sleeper hold rather that served to the advantage Luger was able to get his head moving and the carotid artery might have slipped to one side and that way he avoided uh, being rendered unconscious uh oh uh -huh. and Luger retaliating Luger retaliating and the champion moving desperately now, trying to get away from that sleeper hole being applied by the challenger. Brother, you talk about two great minds uh, operating in the same channel. We've got it here. We certainly do. It's interesting. Just a few moments ago, it was Ric Flair with the sleeper hold on Lex Luger. And now tables have turned. And Lex figured if it worked for Rick, it's going to work for me. But still, I would have to say the perspiration plays a mighty important role in here as Rick is trying to reach up for the ring rope. Flair trying desperately to get into those ropes, and Flair is down. 
And uh, at this, ah, uh -uh, this may be in a disadvantage position here. He's got his foot on the ropes. He's got his foot on the ropes. Got the two count, but that foot is on the rope. That, the, the champion definitely showing. He has a presence of mind to know where he is in the ring at all times. That forces the break, and, uh, well, a relative break, if you will. And it is, uh, again, Luger bringing him up, pressing him over his head. A full slam once again on the champion by the challenger, Lex Luger. And Lex Luger can feel it. He can feel it running through his system. He, he is taunting the crowd, Gordon, no doubt about it. It's amazing. After all the punishment he has taken by Ric Flair that he was able to do that, but it may have cost him. Well, I'll tell you, he was trying to psych out the champion. He was trying to let the champion know, hey, you've thrown your best at me, and you still don't have me pinned. I've got you going in your mind. And uh, you don't tell Ric Flair that. You just don't do it. Ah! Good block and a counter. Good block and a counter and a champion. He was walking on uh, suspended time as far as I'm concerned. Well, there was a blank look when he walked over to referee Bill Alfonso. There was nothing registering in those eyes. Left. 15 minutes, five minutes remaining in the match. Five minutes remaining. And the voice of the timekeeper, Jerry Prater, five minutes remaining. Well, we've heard the cliche, time will tell, and it's going to absolutely be the key figure here, one apiece. Or the falls for each Lex Luger and Ric Flair. You know, it's interesting to note, Stan, that the average uh, pro football game in actual body contact goes, if you count actual body contact, is about 14 and a half to 15 minutes of actual body contact in a pro game. These two men have been going at it hammer and tong now for an equivalent of an entire pro football game, and they're still going after they it. They no certainly half are. But well, that just shows the tremendous physical conditioning that both men have gone through. Of course, they don't train as you would for a professional football team or baseball team. However, uh, with Lex Luger and his background in professional sports and the same thing with Ric Flair, it's paying off for both. And four it is Flair. Four minutes. Four minutes remaining and Flair was the one jammed into that ring post and Flair desperately shaking his head, trying to get rid of those cobwebs and Flair has been lacerated. Flair, when he hit that steel ring post, a severe laceration on his head, and it is, uh, again, Lex Luger jamming his, uh, the champion's head into that steel ring post, and uh, Luger is after him, Luger is after him, smashing him again on the table just outside the ring, and the champion shaking his head, trying to get it together now, trying to get back into that ring, climbing up on the ring ropes. Ah! He's begging not to be tossed. Tremendous strength of Lex Luger after all of that. Luger down now, trying to get the pin ball. And now Luger. He's found the weak plank here, Gordon, and he's going to work on that. He does remember what Rick Lair was doing to that knee just a few minutes ago. Flair backing away, backing up into the uh, corner to our right now, and Luger closing in on him, and Luger is, I think, the... Oh, Flair! Up and over that top rope and down on the ring apron. And it is uh, Luger now moving resolutely against him, but it is Flair who caught him and popped that left leg once again. Well, Rick Flair... With all the blood coming out of his forehead, he still has a presence of mind that he did do some initial injury to that left knee, and he remembered it. It's amazing, the, the ability of the champion. Ric Flair moving back into the ring. Time continues to move here. And it is Flair again after the left leg of Lex Luger. And he's going for the Two bigger four. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes remaining in the match, and it is Luger caught in that figure four. And it is a champion player getting the ring ropes for that extra leverage. What a tremendous battle between these two. Well, it looks as if Ric Flair thinks it's just a matter of moments. It actually is a little less than two minutes left in this match. Look at this. Luger has just reversed. Very rarely will you ever see this occur in the annals of professional wrestling that he has just reversed. 
the figure four leg lock. And Flair was forced to break it because that puts reverse pressure. And then the person applying the hold is taking the pressure instead of the man to whom the hold was applied. And so Flair had to break it. And that is very, very rarely seen. A credit here to Lex Luger and a credit, I must say, to whomever he's been working with. And I have a hunch that may be Root. One minute remaining in the match. One, One minute. minute left to go here, Gordon. Both men. They have been going at it for a tremendous amount of time. Ric Flair looking the worst for wear with the blood coming out of his forehead. However, Lex Luger, I'm sure, has got a tremendous amount of swelling to that left knee. It's just a matter of time. Less than 60 heartbeats away. And it is Flair now issuing all the punishment he can. And it's Luger. 30 seconds remaining. 30 Reversing seconds. it. 30 seconds. There's the power slam. And no, Flair got it up. Flair got that shoulder up just in the nick of time. You heard the count just a moment ago, 30 seconds away. And it's Luger going for the seconds. 15, 15 seconds away. 15 seconds, remember it only takes I one, two, three, three, and it's all over. We're very close, within 10. Five seconds. No way, no way can he do it now. No way can he do it now. And Luger not even aware of the bell. These men are so intensified into this match. I would have to say, you're right, Gordon, neither one has heard the bell. However, Rick Flair has felt it, and so has uh, Lex Luger. All right. One fall each and a draw. One fall each and a draw. It is a draw, and Ric Flair retains the World Heavyweight Championship. Ric Flair came in the champion, is leaving the champion, but I'll tell you what, I don't think he wants to meet up with Lex Luger again. Luger certainly acquitted himself extremely well. A uh, one-fall draw between these the two. The time limit has expired. The referee declares the match a draw. All right, well, we have a, another championship coming up. Barry Windham going up against Ron Bass for the Florida title. A great tribute to both of these men, Rex, uh, Rick Flair and uh, Lex Luger. We'll be right back. And then this match once again as time ran out. And let's see if we can try and catch the expression on the face of Lex Luger as he suddenly realized that uh, it was for naught, that he was not. Here you see him. He thought he had him with his power slam. Brings him down to the canvas. He thought he had it. Rick, the champion, the is, was able to get that shoulder up. He certainly was. It's interesting to note, these two men have been so intensely embattled in here for the last 20 minutes, and, and plus more than that before that, but perhaps not able to hear the uh, time cue, the fact of how much time is remaining as we are able to hear, uh, much like a football game with a two-minute drill or a two-minute uh, time period left. They weren't able to, to hear that, and uh, Lex wasn't able to get that pinfall. Time ran out, and so Ric Flair retains the title. We'll be back in just a moment. In just and this is one fall with a 30-minute time limit. The Florida heavyweight title is on the line. Introducing first the challenger from Sweetwater, Texas, at a weight of 270 pounds, Barry Windham. <laughs> Introducing from Pampas, Texas, at a weight of 280 pounds, he is the current Florida heavyweight champion, the big bad cowboy, Ron Bass. Cowboy Ron Bass, the NWA Florida heavyweight champion, being uh, checked out now by referee Jimmy Jett. Barry Windham, the challenger. Windham, an immensely popular young athlete, has had a problem with uh, that left, and it's a uh, it was Bass trying to Sunday uh, Mr. Wyndham, and Mr. Wyndham was up and one step ahead of him. Beautiful slam by Barry Wyndham, and Bass rolls from the ring. Well, the feud continues. There is no lost love between these two. As a matter of fact, there's been many opportunity that Cowboy Ron Bass has wanted to take advantage of uh, 
Kendall Wyndham as well as Barry Wyndham. We uh, have seen him many times. He's just trying his best to do whatever he can legally and illegally against Barry Wyndham. Brother Wyndham is making this concrete floor rock as he uh, power slammed uh, Cowboy Ron Bass to the canvas and Barry Wyndham back into the ring. And Bass, the champion, in a lot of trouble now. He's got a lot of problems. And it looks like his uh, arm and hand. Like that left arm and hand. And it is Wyndham bringing him in. High vertical suplex. Tremendous athletic ability on the part of Barry Wyndham to lift Cowboy Ron Bass all the way over that rope. Tremendous ability. Certainly no question about it. And now it is the Cowboy Ron Bass. A near fall and it is Wyndham pounding away at the head of the big Cowboy. Off the ropes. A good shoulder smash by Wyndham now. Bass drops to the canvas. And this time it was uh, Bass changing the direction of uh, Barry Wyndham. And that had him full tilt into the turnbuckle. And it was the lariat by the... Bass doing something with that uh, with the elbow that, uh, guard. I was just going to point that out. He uh, seems to be adjusting it a little bit more so than is necessary for what he's been doing. Uh, trying to get a better look at what he might be pulling out of there. I can't see anything as yet, Gordon. Well, I'll tell you what, our time is completely gone. Uh, hopefully we'll continue to videotape this and uh, bring this to you on another day. The battle now between... Uh, uh, Barry Windham and Cowboy Ron Bass for the Florida Heavyweight Championship. But for the Battle of the Belts, our time is rapidly running out. So, may we take this opportunity to say it's been a pleasure to be with you from the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, Florida, the home of the Fabulous 500, and Stan, a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely enjoyed it, Gordon, very much so. Our thanks to the entire crew. Until the next time around, Gordon slowly saying so long. Come on, lay it back in the back. career took place during the Battle of the Belts, and notwithstanding, certainly, the climax of the evening was the Florida Heavyweight Championship match between Barry Windham and the Cowboy Ron Bass. Let's rejoin the Battle of the Belts 3 now as we pick up the closing moments. This is the first time that uh, this uh, portion of the program has been aired because this uh, went off after uh, the program time limit had expired, and it is Barry Windham bloodied but unbowed at this particular point in time. Uh, before a standing room only crowd at the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach and you see Wyndham from Sweetwater, Texas using that right hand to great advantage as the big cowboy from Pampas, Texas down on the mat. Uh, Wyndham now pounding away once again at this point, buddy, of course, they've thrown away the rule book. That's right. This is well into the match. Uh, the, both men are exhausted. They are tired. They have been going for a long time here. They have completely forgotten about wrestling right now. They are just out to win this match at any and all cost and uh, Barry brother Kendall had this title uh, previous to uh, Ron Bass having it and Barry is really out to get that title now he really sincerely wants that Florida title and he is doing everything that he can Ron Bass right now down on his back uh, not a lot of energy left but like I said before well into the match both men are tired he's all used up a lot of energy under those hot lights and uh, right now there's a big lariat across the upper chest and throat of Ron Bass and this looks like this could be the end of it Barry Wyndham moving in now and uh, trying to get that pinball uh, scored and uh, notice grabbing uh, the uh, knee guard rather than going under the leg. A headbutt here now by Cowboy Ronda. Staggers Wyndham back into the ropes again. Both men uh, really feeling the 
pressure and uh, time here of this particular match. It had been a thrilling night of wrestling competition all the way down the line. Wyndham uncorks a right hand. Wyndham sizes his man up, measures from the backyard, and they exchange punches to the job. And again, both men are staggered backwards. And uh, it appears it, that uh, it is uh, Wyndham indeed who is pressing the advantage here for that Florida heavyweight championship. Bass holding on as best he can. Bass drops to the canvas. It is uh, Bass Wyndham gliding in the center of the ring. And uh, both men have expended tremendous amounts of energy at this point in time. A referee now signaling the count on both men. Of course, if they achieve a 10 count here, with neither man up, uh, then the match is over. But as you can see, both men doggedly determined. And it, uh, Barry Windham now with a head butt to the side of the head of the cowboy Ron Bass. And now both men slugging it out from a kneeling position. Uh, the intensity hits an all. You know, these men are just really battling on pure instinct and instinct alone right now. Uh, you can't even really be confident of what's happening. Just that raw determination that both of these men possess just makes them keep going on, knowing there is a, a lot at stake here. The part of the title is a very prestigious title. A lot of uh, prestige goes with that, along with the money that the champion makes from defending that title. And right now, it's like Barry is on his feet, Ron Bass down. Uh, Barry has a very slight advantage here, but... Barry Wyndham is also doggedly tired. Uh, well, he couldn't. He didn't have enough energy to body slam Ron there, and consequently, he fell back with Ron on the top of him. But still, the battle continues and rages on. And uh, these men, are just, I don't know what keeps them going at this time. Cowboy Ron Bass rocks to his knees once again after being taken by another hard right hand. The Florida title is indeed prestigious. It uh, is uh, thought by many to be the forerunner to the uh, World Heavyweight Championship currently held by Rick. And, uh, of course, we talk, remember the, uh, uh, Jack Briscoe, who had the Florida title, went on to become a, one of the great NWA world champions. Uh, Barry Wyndham, obviously, would like to follow in those footsteps if he can. And it's Wyndham now uh, utilizing a knee into the uh, upper thigh muscles of uh, Cowboy Ron Bass. And you can see here that Wyndham is pulling out all stops, a snap mare back into the ring. Wyndham now... Uh, is uh, a bit more the aggressor and uh, it is Bass who seems the worst for wear here as Wyndham back on his feet and again Bass rolling outside the ring trying to break any momentum that Bass or, or that Wyndham may have uh, garnered and uh, but he comes right back for more action and now look at Bass turning the tables and Wyndham now is in trouble for the champion beginning to exert and of course he's a tremendously powerful man 280 pounds out of Pampas, Texas And there again, you see him uh, doing something with that uh, uh, elbow guard. And Wyndham catches him coming in. Wyndham brings him up, tries to set it, and a beautiful move by Bass as he counters in. And look at the automatic uh, counter move by Barry Wyndham as uh, he catches him in that reverse, gets the uh, three, uh, three count, and uh, wins the Florida. Heavyweight Championship. Wyndham has agreed to a 30-day rematch clause, however, so uh, Wyndham will have to defend against Cowboy Ron Bass within 30 days. But for right now, Battle of the Belts 3, it was indeed Barry Wyndham winning the Florida Heavyweight Championship. We'll be right back.